Great. Thank you very much, Denise, uh, for the nice introduction. And of course, want to welcome and thank um, all of you, our customers, for taking the time uh, to be with us today on today's webinar uh, discussion on some of the myths and misconceptions around uh, international investing. Um, as Denise mentioned, my name is Matt Godfrey. I'm part of the investment product team here at Fidelity. And I'm going to be playing the role of the next you know, 30 to 40 minutes of sort of moderator and quarterback for the discussion, pulling in uh, my colleagues, Jake and Greg. Uh, but before we sort of get into the discussion in the back and forth part of the program, I thought we could start uh, with just a little bit of context in terms of how this webinar topic came to be and sort of why we're here. And I think a good starting point for that is just to revisit international equity in the context of asset allocation. And we think uh, at Fidelity, we think that international is really a core kind of foundational part of a sound asset allocation strategy. And you can see that demonstrated here in the exhibit uh, below in the slide, uh, which is a look at what we call uh, our target asset mix models or TAMs. And we use these models of Fidelity to help all of you, our customers, to assign different goals and risk tolerances to the different uh, accounts that you, that you own. Um, but they serve another purpose too, which is to give you an asset allocation framework or reference point for you to consider as you start uh, to assemble your portfolio. And I just want to make a couple of very quick points with respect to how international stock exposure shows up across these models, because I think it's very important and perhaps relevant to you as you think about your own portfolios and how they may be um, sort of positioned today. And the first point I'd make is just notice uh, in each of the models at the bottom there that it, the role that international stocks have, they are located in every type of portfolio you, hear, you see here in, in different proportional amounts. So whether you have an, a, a more conservative, maybe a capital uh, preservation goal on the far left, all the way to more of an aggressive, maybe a capital appreciation or growth goal on the far right, really regardless of your goal or your risk tolerance, you can see that there is a role of international in every portfolio in, in a proportional amount. And it's a longer conversation why, but the rationale is really rooted uh, in the basic tenets of diversification, right? So if you add different exposures, different asset classes, and different geographies, hopefully those assets move uh, imperfectly or, or, or behave differently, and that delivers diversification in the form of better risk-adjusted returns. And so that's kind of point number one. Point number two is more just related to the actual amount of international exposure you need. And as you can see, your international allocation as a percent of your total portfolio is really driven by the profile that you choose, whether, you know, whatever goal or objective you have. So again, if you're conservative, your allocation might be in the neighborhood of 6% international. If you move all the way to most aggressive, your allocation be up to 30%. And again, that's total portfolio. So the number I would ask you um, to key on is what is international as a percent of your total equity? And as you'll see in these charts, it requires you to do a little bit of math, but the percent of equity is always a consistent 30%. So again, as you leave this webinar and hopefully, you know, think about next steps, um, maybe taking a look at your own portfolio and your own portfolio mix, remember that one rule of thumb, right? When you think about the stock part of your portfolio, we think that having roughly in the neighborhood of 30% international and 70% domestic will deliver uh, or allow you to take advantage of the diversification benefits um, I just described. So, now that chart makes a nice tidy case for international. I think the reality is, is that we know many investors and many of you on the line uh, may be quite nervous, may be quite skeptical about investing uh, in foreign equities today. And in fact, earlier this year we did conduct a survey asking for feedback from customers about how they felt about international investing. And you could see some of the concerns that are surfaced here really explain uh, why there is such a low appetite or interest in investing abroad. You can see the, the, the concerns around geopolitical risks, uh, volatility, uh, questions about currency. You also see a lot of mentions around the U.S. exposure uh, that uh, they get, uh, clients feel they get sufficient diversification benefits from their U.S. allocation. And so really that, in a nutshell, is why we're here today. Uh, we want to unpack some of these myths, some of these perceptions, um, test them out, and hopefully along the way, uh, with Greg's help, introduce you to some of the resources that can help you sort of find and manage an allocation um, that's right for you. So with that, um, I'd like to pivot now to our discussion on the five myths, and I'm going to bring in my friend Jake uh, Weinstein from our asset, uh, asset management organization. Uh, Jake, thanks for being with us. 
Thank you, Matt. Happy to be here. Okay. Um, Jake, I'm going to just click right in here to our first myth. And, you know, one of the sentiments we just showed in the exhibit there was this notion of international investments uh, being too volatile. How would you tackle sort of that perception out there about international investing and risk? Great. Uh, so this is something I hear very often uh, when I talk to clients regarding our kind of way we think about international with an asset allocation. International is too risky, it's too volatile. In fact, from the survey you just showed, if you actually do the adding up all of the reasons, over half of them uh, respondents basically say that whether it's geopolitical uncertainty or lack of transparency, that too much volatility is the reason for avoiding international markets. And so when you kind of think about all these things we see in the news, whether it's Brexit, Great Britain leaving the European Union, or, or China being in a kind of a multi-year funk, or, or Brazil having political turmoil, it could be pretty scary on an individual kind of short-term basis. And then if you kind of look at this chart here, and you actually look, think about risk from a volatility perspective, yes, international stocks do on their own appear more risky and volatile than just the U.S. alone. But the way we think about international from an asset allocation perspective, which is really the kind of theme that we're going to be talking about today, if you just combine that 30% international equity sleeve within your greater U.S. equity, you could actually reduce the overall volatility in your overall portfolio. And this has been pretty consistent over the last 65 years. Adding international, there's diversification benefits. There's correlations that are below one, and you can do that and be able to overall reduce your risk. And so while people may think that international is more risky, adding international, in fact, actually reduces overall risk. So, Jake, um, just a follow-up question for you. I think this exhibit, as you mentioned, looks at portfolio from a risk perspective. I think, um, you know, it's important to customers the, the, the how smooth the ride is. I think many of us have different time horizons for all of our goals and understanding volatility is, is definitely important. Um, what do you say about returns, though? Does, does international add, add gross uh, or improve the return profile of a portfolio? Um, what, what would this chart look like with, with return data? Yeah, so the, the things definitely have changed over the last 60 years. I don't want to try to say the world's going to look exactly the same as it has over the past. Uh, certainly, there's been more globalization, uh, and yes, international markets have indeed become more correlated with the overall globe. So, going forward, will they provide as much diversification? Maybe not as much, but certainly, uh, we think that they will going forward. Now, think about recently. Again, kind of thinking about people and what they may be thinking about. They're very myopic. They think about kind of the short term, what's been happening in the past. And yes, 2008, 2009 was a period where international uh, markets moved very similar to that of the U.S., and maybe those diversification benefits weren't quite there. Now, from a return perspective, historically, you were actually able to get good returns from international markets uh, and had exposure to equities. And so um, the way we kind of thinking about this, uh, again, kind of from a time horizon standpoint, is that over the very long term, our view is that emerging markets with our most favorable, with more favorable demographics than the U.S., and there's also many countries that have uh, more favorable productivity growth. In conjunction with those, we think that economic growth and stock market returns over the next, say, 20 years will indeed be higher than that of the U.S., and therefore there are distinct opportunities from a return perspective. Okay, good. I think it's probably a good segue, this you know, notion of a long-term perspective, uh, to our next myth. So, uh, I think it's probably fair to say uh, performance of the U.S. stock market has captured a lot of the interest of especially equity investors uh, in recent years. Um, the, the, I, I think uh, the S&P has actually outperformed a diversified basket of international stocks in, in five of the last six calendar years. So, Jake, what do you say to investors who uh, think the U.S. has the best companies, the best opportunities, and sort of always outperforms? Yeah, so I would, uh, being, a, being an American, I definitely would say the Americans do have very good companies, very good uh, stock markets, good rule of law, uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of opportunities overseas, especially if you can kind of unco uncover those hidden gems which our active managers here at Fidelity do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so what this kind of chart basically shows is that, yeah, yes, people think that the stocks, U.S. stocks generally outperform, and over the last six, seven, eight years, yes, that has been the case. You can kind of see that from this chart, and the way to kind of interpret this is that 
Um, when the blue shading is above zero, that means the international markets have outperformed the U.S. in recent years. And when it's below zero, that means international has actually underperformed the U.S. And so it's very clear there's a very cyclical type of, of, uh, of pattern here where over several years the U.S. seems to be in favor and over the next several years the international seems to be in favor. And you could just look at what's been happening over the most recent years. Yes, the U.S. has outperformed. Now, is there an opportunity here that this, this cycle phase could kind of shift? Absolutely. And it's something that we focus on a lot in the asset allocation research team. Uh, in fact, uh, when we publish our business cycle updates on a monthly basis, and those can be found on Fidelity.com, you actually see that there are certain economies that are, have better cyclical opportunities than that of the U.S. Europe, for example, we have kind of in the mid-cycle, a little bit before kind of the, the cycle that the U.S. is in, and other countries which may seem very scary to invest in, like, say, China, Russia, Brazil. Yes, there's a lot of kind of political turmoil, as I mentioned before, but those countries may be kind of coming to a bottom. Their recessionaries, their recessions may be ending over the next six months to a year. And ultimately, basically what that means is there could be some great cheap opportunities for international investors to take advantage of. So trying to time this exactly, not very easy, and that's why we always suggest having at least some international exposure for you in your overall portfolio from a diversification benefit. But kind of back to your question before, Will there be potential returns in international? This chart basically suggests that over time there will be, and I'm basically, on our research, we're thinking that over the next several months to year, yes, going forward, may likely be a very good period for international stocks relative to those in the U.S. Thank you, Jake. So, you know, you touched on valuations a little bit in your response. Um, I just, you know, I think a natural question is, is, is how much uh, confidence an investor can have that, in when the inflection points are. Um, you know, mean reversion, certainly, you know, one of the only guarantees in investing. But what, what things are you seeing across the asset allocation research team that suggest, you know, we may or may not be at a turning point where international might outperform? Yeah, so... Um, so and it's a loaded yeah. question. I mean, uh, it's a loaded question. <laughs> absolutely. Well, uh, obviously, you're familiar with, uh, with, our, with our materials and our research in terms of how we're thinking about things. Uh, but, you know, kind of when you think about that, it's, it's, it's really that um, it, it all comes down to the fact that, again, there's these kind of opportunities, whether it's regionally or country by country or sector by sector, where uh, international investors really can kind of take advantage of, of, of these kind of opportunities. And, and just by looking at historical mean reversion patterns, whether you're looking at returns or whether you're looking at valuation, I would actually say that that's something that we don't focus too heavily on. Uh, it's something that people can get really kind of bogged down with is the fact that emerging market stocks are cheap or international stocks are cheap or U.S. stocks are cheap. Well, a lot of times things are cheap for a reason, and you really got to do your research and figure out why are those individual stocks, sectors, regions cheap? Uh, so we don't look at valuation alone. Uh, I would say valuation is something that does tend to uh, pan out and work well over the very long term. Uh, it's a very good predictor of long-term long returns. And if you're kind of an investor with a very long-term, secular horizon, not trying to time these exact markets, cheap valuations in these international markets are definitely a very good way to kind of think about should I be entering at this point, especially if I have very little to no international exposure. But just kind of thinking about these cycles, kind of what I'm showing here on the left, valuations don't really matter that much. What does matter is, is growth prospects. Kind of what I mentioned before, how is, where is an economy in the business cycle? What are their long-term pr prospects? What are their kind of short-term, kind of near-term kind of things that could distort any type of cycle or kind of be a cycle killer is kind of we like to refer to it. So thinking about in, in investing again from kind of all these three time horizons, whether it's short term, intermediate term, or long term, trying to figure out what your goal is and tying that goal and that time horizon goal with kind of your view is a really good kind of uh, tool to utilize when thinking about investing, not just internationally, but, but all over the globe. Yep, those are good habits. Thank you. All right, moving on. Let's move ahead to uh, myth number three. Um, you see quite a bit about the, this in the newspaper these days around uh, 
the globalization of certain indexes, right? So roughly one-third of the revenue of companies in the S&P 500 actually comes from outside the U.S. I think we all recognize we live in a global marketplace. Is it true, um, Jake, that investors can get sufficient international exposure by investing in these big uh, multinational firms, the Cokes, the, the GEs, the IBMs of the world? Great. Yeah, yes, another loaded question, Matt. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, so this is another one that I hear very often. Uh, people kind of say, okay, well, Fidelity, you may say 30% international equity is a good allocation, but hey, you know, the S&P 500 has 30% allocation or exposure to international markets, so uh, I like the U.S., I like I kind of have more certainty there, so I'm not going to bother investing internationally. But when you really dig beneath the surface, and really try to figure out how do companies generally perform, there is a much tighter fit. There's a much tighter correlation with those individual companies to their general home markets than, their, than those to their global industrial kind of type of sectors, I should say. So what do I mean by that? So basically looking at this chart, looking at four different sectors, financials, telecom, consumer staples, and technology, if you look at individual, you know, kind of large multinational stocks and how their correlation is in the U.S., these top four being Citigroup, Verizon, Procter Gamble, and Apple, they tend to have much higher correlation, meaning that to their home market, to the S&P 500, which means that despite the fact that these four companies have a significant amount, and sometimes in excess of over 50% of their sales and revenue exposure to, to consumers or businesses outside the U.S., despite that, these companies tend to have much more in common their return characteristics than to the S&P 500 than to kind of their international global benchmarks. And so you really do need to go outside of the U.S. home market, get these companies that are listed outside of the U.S. to get the best type of diversification benefits uh, in order to really take advantage of what international provides to an overall portfolio. Is there anything you'd say as far as how these are trending? Uh, you know, it, it, it's mm -hmm. a natural sort of question. If, if companies become more globally integrated, can't we assume their correlations will merge? Uh, yeah, I would. Um, I've thought about this a lot lately, and, and something that's really probably driving this, I would say, quote unquote, inefficiency mm -hmm. uh, is the, really the role of passive investors who've come to the market. Uh, passive investors really kind of, they, 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 they have to then essentially buy individual stocks within a particular benchmark. And since they have to do that, that may potentially basically say, well, if the U.S. market is up for the day, that means that U.S. stocks within that benchmark have to go up as well and vice versa. So with all the people kind of going into passive uh, that could create basically opportunities where uh, companies that are located outside the U.S. can provide better sources of return, of risk reduced mitigants, of diversification benefits. You know, will that pattern uh, go away? Uh, time will tell us. You know, again, everything kind of works cyclically. International works cyclically versus the U.S. Active passive, which we'll talk about in a little bit, sometimes acts cyclically as well. Uh, so that's kind of one thing that could be creating this kind of, uh, you know, unexpected diversion type of patterns. But if you look at the data even further and go back in time, this has this kind of relationship between U.S. stocks behaving more like, or multinationals behaving more like their home country than overseas has remained and has certainly been the case. Uh, one thing I do want to mention is if you do have, say, large cap exposure in your, in your U.S., Yes, you do have more international exposure. That is true, not as much as you would international stocks, uh, but much more so than if you had small caps. So if you had U.S. small caps, those have no exposure to international, and that may basically say that, hey, international is a good way to kind of diversify against a more you know, pure, direct United States stock exposure. Those are interesting points about passive, and I know we'll talk about that later, but just to... Uh, plant a, a data point uh, for our customers. Right now, today, approximately 70% of all uh, shareholders or dollars are invested in funds and ETFs are, are uh, managed by active managers. Um, and while passive approach, uh, uh, 
passive approaches are certainly gaining traction. That does suggest, um, to some extent, that investors understand there are inefficiencies, as you alluded to, in international markets, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, all right, let's move on here to myth number four. You know, one of the themes that was very clear in the survey results we shared earlier was uh, around uh, currency concerns. Um, this makes a lot of sense. I think the dollar strengthened certainly in, in recent months. Um, we continue to see, Jake, I know your team tracks this quite uh, closely, the, a lot of continued monetary easing with some big economies, China, Europe, uh, Japan certainly. Um, for U.S.-based investors, a rising dollar actually works against them, right, because the securities that they own in international markets, when they get converted back, will be worth less. So what do you say to investors uh, that may be wondering about hedging currency to mitigate uh, sort of currency risk or to improve returns? Yeah, so, so this is something we've obviously thought about a lot over the last several years, mainly because uh, the dollar has just done so well, not only just against, you know, Europe or the, you know, the euro or the yen, but like pretty much every currency out there, I'd say it's basically beating everybody. And a lot of it has to do with the monetary policy divergences and the differences among, among the world. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's really very difficult to figure out how much of those, that potential U.S. dollar appreciation has already been priced in. And so you continue to kind of think, well, the Fed is going to raise rates, and so, and then the ECB and Bank of Japan are going to continue to kind of ease policy that could only mean the dollar has one way to go up. Well, that news has been kind of been floated around for the last couple of years, and the dollar as a result has kind of had a very impressive uh, accelerant. So our view on currencies uh, is that, you know, will the dollar go up from here? Maybe. Do we have much conviction? Not really at all. And really the reason for that is that it's extremely, extremely difficult to kind of predict where currencies are heading over the short term. And so rather, the perspective we kind of take from, again, kind of this portfolio construction asset allocation view is what will currency hedging do for you over the long run? And so looking at this chart, it looks like a bunch of kind of mess and noise, and, and that's essentially what it is. Um, looking at kind of the red bars, that means there's, those are the periods when foreign currency detracts from returns. Blue periods means that currency it helps boost returns. You kind of add these all up over the very long run over the last 40 years, and it basically sums to zero. So trying to basically say, today I'm going to hedge my currency in a couple years, maybe when the Fed's done, I'm not going to hedge currency, is very challenging. We kind of don't really try to do this ourselves here at Fidelity because we know we know we know we kind of try to focus on what we're good at, which is macroeconomic research, cyclical research, secular secular long-term growth trends. But trying to figure out where currencies are heading in the short term is very challenging. So since it's challenging, since over the long run it's basically a zero-sum game, why bother paying somebody to hedge currencies? You got to engage in contracts, forward contracts, futures contracts. They may be cheap now. They may not be cheap when interest rates go up in a couple years, five years, ten years. Who knows? So it's just a perspective from our consideration over the long run. Why bother? So therefore, why bother paying for it? And over the long term, hedging is probably uh, not worth the troubles that uh, many people probably try to make it seem that it's better off to do so. So it's a cost. It's a wash. And we're not good at it. Uh, well, we, we'd be saying that I'd say most, most investors uh, are probably not good at it consistently. I, I think they will, make good, they will make good investors. calls. They will yep. make good calls, uh, but at the end of the day, it's something that it's not in our breadbasket, so we're not going to focus yeah. on it, but yes. Uh, you know, and I'd just add to that, because we get this question occasionally um, from the product side, uh, and in, in similar sentiments to what you say, you know, do we hedge currency within our actively managed uh, international portfolios. And I think, you know, it ties very closely to your points earlier. Um, you know, what's our core competency? And I think we found uh, separate research that, you know, it's the fundamental stock-specific factors that are the biggest drivers of returns. Um, things, you know, like earnings growth and multiple expansion, it's not currency. And so that's, to your point, Jake, from, uh, you know, that's what you focus on. That's certainly what uh, the portfolio managers and the research team uh, for our, that underlie our funds focus on. Um, we let the fundamentals drive the investment decision-making and don't uh, hedge currency in our portfolios. So. Okay. 
Um, let's move on uh, to myth number five. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier. I think um, the appeal of indexing and passive approaches is sort of well documented, uh, especially in our industry and in the trade press in recent years. Um, passive, you know, offers some benefits, lower cost, diversification. Uh, you know, there is the perception out there, I think, Jake, that indexing is, is a superior approach uh, everywhere. And I just wonder if you could unpack that a little bit. Is that true uh, in international markets? Yeah, so this is the fifth and final myth to debunk, and I would say this is the easiest one to do so because uh, we've got one very, very simple chart here. Have active managers, the average active manager, has he or she been uh, successful relative to passive strategies? And you can see here that yes, clearly. You know, say what you want about U.S. large caps, say what you want about other markets. International markets are inefficient. They are less covered. Those who can kind of cover the globe better and have the better analysts out there will be able to beat the market on average. Uh, and they've been doing so. You can kind of see this blue bar and green bar. You take the difference of them. The average man active manager has beaten the passive strategy by over 1% per year since 1992. That is a lot of returns to give up by giving to a passive investor. Will these trends continue going forward? We certainly think so and certainly think that's the case. I mean, why is that? It's because international markets continue to be inefficient. There's a lot more leverage you could pull that's great for international investing. You can think about things from a, from a country perspective, a sector perspective. You can kind of think about things from a cap perspective. There's a lot of international small caps all around the globe that offer great return potential and also offer great uh, diversification benefits. And so I could just overwhelmingly say, in my opinion, that uh, active, if you're going to go anywhere, international uh, is certainly a place where uh, it's definitely, in our, my opinion, a good place to be. Yeah, and this is powerful evidence. I mean, I, I, without getting too far into sort of the religion of active and passive and approaches, you know, one of the things that was one of the big flaws in the debate is that most of the information presented on either side tends to focus on the industry as a whole or sort of the average passive manager or the average active manager. And uh, I, I, obviously there's a little bias uh, with my perspective, but we feel like that's something that's incredibly uh, short-sighted or misleading here at Fidelity where we've been uh, researching and covering individual stocks for over 65 years. Uh, we don't believe we are average and we think that we can certainly prove we are not representative of the average through um, uh, the results and investment outcomes we're delivering uh, across our funds. And so just be careful when you, when you read our stories in the, in the trade press uh, and watch out for, for some of the averages because customers have choices uh, and they have the ability to find good managers that can deliver strong returns. Okay, um, thank you, Jake. Uh, appreciate your perspective. Um, I think at this point we want to turn it over to Greg Lee uh, for a little bit of a demo, uh, take us through some of the resources available uh, to you, our customers, uh, on international investing. Greg, over to you. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, Matt. And um, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on what side of the country you're on. Um, my name is Greg Lee. Once again, I'm one of the regional brokerage consultants that uh, works with um, the, the different investor centers around the country. And, you know, some of the investor centers and most of the investor centers, you know, on a regular basis has, you know, educational opportunities such as seminars. And, of course, we do the webinars. Or you have the chance to meet with someone individually to discuss some of the concepts that we've talked today. So if you're a Fidelity client um, and you haven't met your regional brokerage consultant yet, um, by all means, please contact us or contact your financial consultant as we'd be more than happy to discuss some of these concepts with you, as well as help you um, walk you through some of the content that I'm going to be delivering in the next uh, 15, 20 minutes or so, which is how we can take this information um, using international investing. Hopefully it piqued some of your interest um, or at least made you realize the importance of international investing and how you can use some of the tools on our website in order to put some of these thoughts, concepts to work. So I'm going to walk through a few things today, but by all means, this is not your end-all, be-all of the education here at Fidelity. And I'll probably walk through it fast, fast or slow, depending on your familiarity with the, with the website. But just keep in mind that we are here to help you. So you can call us 24-7. You can come into one of the investor centers, and we'll be happy to help you out um, with this. 
So the first thing that comes to mind when I think about international investing is a lot of investors, I find, aren't really sure what their allocation is. Now, that doesn't necessarily even go to international investing, but that goes across you know, the entire scope of asset allocation, whether it's sector investing, whether it's how you're invested in terms of the capitalization models or the style box. So one of the things that I like showing clients, and I think it's very important to understand, is you can get a nice overview of how you're allocated by logging into your account and clicking on this tab right here in the middle of your screen called the Analysis tab. And what the Analysis tab does, it does a lot of different things, and unfortunately we don't have the time to go into everything that the Analysis tab does. But the first thing that I'm going to look for is my allocation. How am I diversified, not only here domestically, um, in terms of the equities versus fixed income, but in terms of my equity portfolio, how much is dedicated towards international exposure? And this not only includes individual securities, but will also include any mutual funds that you might have. Um, it unwraps the mutual funds and will indicate your level of exposure to international funds as well. So in this test account that I'm using here, um, I have 26% foreign stock. And if you remember toward one of the first slides um, that we had is, is one of the suggestions was is a maximum of 30% of the equity portion of your portfolio. So, you know, we are still in line there. It's 26% of our equity portfolio is dedicated towards foreign stock. So if you're, if you're interested in saying, you know what, I have a diversified portfolio of mutual funds or I have some individual stocks scattered there, I wonder how much international exposure I have, take a look at the analysis tab and we can get a sense of what your breakdown is um, very simply, very quickly, very easily. So this is called our Guided Portfolio Summary, and that's under the Analysis tab. But I want to take a dive into some of the research that Fidelity provides. Like we mentioned earlier, we've been doing this for over 60 years, and yes, we are a little biased, but we think we do a really good job of providing, you know, not only managing money in terms of international funds, which we'll talk about here shortly, but also providing guidance and providing insight um, for some of you on the phone that are self-directed investors that like making some of your own decisions. So the first thing I want to just point out is if I click under News and Insights at the top of my screen, I have several different links here. One of them is News, one of them is Insights. But one of the links that I sh look at on a regular basis, and I actually get these emailed to me, as you can as well by clicking on Subscribe to Viewpoints, is Economic Insight, Market Insight, Investing Ideas, Retirement Ideas, you get the idea here up at the uh, top of the screen with these little links, but these are articles written by Fidelity for Fidelity clients. And so this was probably about five years ago where the, the co most common question that we received was, or one of the most common questions that we received was, what does Fidelity think about the market? We did a, we've always done a great job of providing a lot of research from third-party providers, but you know, Fidelity at one point shied away from telling people what they thought about the market or giving their economic ideas or insight. And so this is where Fidelity Viewpoints comes into play. And so if I click on, for example, if I click on Market and Economic Insights, and again, sticking with the theme of international investing, I can see a number of different stories, once again, written by Fidelity. For example, Viewpoints, five market themes that might have international ideas in there. Global volatility, how does that impact your portfolio, right? If I scroll down a little bit, I see articles such as global risks rising, global reflation versus deflation, an article on China. And not only will these articles give you a sense of what is happening, but they will also do a good job of telling you how this may impact your portfolio going forward. And, of course, some, some of these articles might say there's opportunities elsewhere, outside in terms of international. Others might say you have uh, some risks ahead. So by all means, take a look at Fidelity's viewpoints. And once again, if I just roll my mouse over News and Insights, click on Viewpoints, in the upper right-hand side, you'll see a button that says Subscribe to Viewpoints. And even if you are not a Fidelity client, feel free to subscribe to the Viewpoints, get a sense of what Fidelity is telling, um, and get a sense of what Fidelity thinks about the market and the global economy and the current environment.
And so that's great for big picture macro views, but then how can we put those to work? Well, of course we can put those to work for, through a variety of different ways. Um, most importantly, and we've mentioned it before, but you know, one of the things that Fidelity has done for um, you know, well over uh, 50 years plus, um, and it's our origins, is the mutual fund industry. So if I click on research and then mutual funds, this will allow me to gain international exposure through either a Fidelity mutual fund or perhaps you're looking for a mutual fund outside of Fidelity. So right here under fund picks from Fidelity, now keep in mind there are thousands and thousands of mutual funds, so how do we narrow this down? And so one or two easy ways that we do this are fund picks from Fidelity, and then also we use our third-party experts to get their best ideas in terms of mutual funds. And we categorize them. So if I use the fund picks from Fidelity, for example, notice here that I have different categories, U.S. equity, sector equity, and then, yes, down below here, international equity funds. And if I use this drop-down list, I can get country or region specific if I'd like. For example, there's China. Maybe you just read that Viewpoints article on China and you want to put some money to work there. You can click on the China region and you'll get a list of recommended Fidelity fund picks that specialize in the China region. Or, and notice here, you have things like Europe. Um, and then we go into the style boxes. So many of you are familiar with large blend values, small cap companies, and then Japan. Or if you want a broader exposure um, across the globe, simply use world stock. And if I click on world stock, just to give you an example of what this looks like, you will see a handful of, again, fidelity funds, as well as funds from other fund managers, which lists different characteristics of the funds, such as performance, such as Morningstar rating, and of course, expense ratios. And so this just kind of gives you a nice, easy way, if you want global exposure, again, you can do it as easy as country specific, regional specific, or if you want entire global exposure, maybe pick all world. And so that is the fun picks from Fidelity. And then of course, just once again, if I go back here under research and mutual funds, I also have the picks from independent experts. And I can click on the view funds there. And once again, we have these different categories. And so we use two third-party providers here, Kiplinger as well as Money Magazine. And once again, they definitely have a lot of international flavor or international picks. And so there's four international mutual funds that Kiplinger says might be worth looking at. And they're all, when you see this link here, they're all no transaction fee, which means Fidelity clients do not have to pay anything to buy or to sell these particular mutual funds. So mutual funds are a great way to do it. Um, of course, you know, we, we talked about it earlier, but, you know, and this could, there's a whole argument back there, and, and Matt and Jake t touched on it earlier, but, you know, you could also buy index funds if you want to. But, you know, we think especially with the international exposure and as, as more specific that as you get in looking for a certain country or a certain area, you know, we feel that active management might be the best way to go. And that's simply because, you know, we're putting the effort, the resources, the research in um, to make sure we're hopefully buying the right companies um, that's going to give you our performance over time. And so that's the mutual fund research. And then, of course, many of our self-directed investors are, are moving towards this mutual, not only mutual funds, but also ETFs. And so through Fidelity's ETF offering, we have a number of different ways that you can invest internationally. And so right here under research and ETFs, I have a nice, easy way. So, for example, I can do geographical searches, regional searches, or if I want to go to a specific country, I can do that as well. So if I wanted a specific country, notice when I click on country, this will load up the ETF screener, if you will, and there's 208 different country-specific funds. So ETFs oftentimes allow you to get even more specific to pinpoint a targeted area of the market, whether it's domestically or internationally, to invest in just what you, what you want to do. So for example, I'm just going to see what comes up here. But for example, if you wanted exposure to a foreign currency, you have the ability to buy an ETF that tracks the performance of the Australian dollar. I'm um, just scrolling down here, for example. 
Um, here's a Brazilian ETF that is also currency hedged. I know we uh, don't necessarily do that on a regular basis, but we have that ability to as well. And 208 different country-specific ETFs that you can choose from. And once again, I just like doing this because it, I always get the questions, how did you get there? I just clicked on research and ETFs, and then down below, I just simply clicked on, once this comes up here, various country. Or I could create my own screen if I'm looking for something specific as well, of course. Now, one other thing I must mention when, I, when we talk about ETFs, especially here at Fidelity, is the partnership that we have with iShares. And yes, several of them do allow you international exposure. So if I scroll here, and these are all the commission-free ETFs, I can see here, for example, that I have international exposure. So right off the bat, here on the first page, I have a Japanese ETF, which I can buy and sell without paying any commission. I can scroll through the pages, and you'll see things like All World. You'll see things like the EFA. Um, you'll see things like Emerging Markets, All Country X Japan, Latin America. Again, giving Fidelity clients, giving you um, pinpoint exposure in certain cases or broad exposure, depending on what your strategy is, all for a very low cost without paying any, without paying any transactions. So we talked a little bit about the overall research, which is through the Fidelity viewpoints, and I would recommend taking a look at that. And then taking some of those ideas from some of those articles written by Fidelity, and then how do we you know, use that information for investable ideas. And then we can go to the research in mutual funds or research in ETFs. Now, of course, it's easy for me to say I've clicked through these links and it's pretty quick for me, but how, do, how can you learn more about these concepts? How can you learn more about these tools on how to get international exposure? Well, I want to introduce you to research and the learning, learning center on fidelity.com. Many of you, that's probably how you signed up for this webinar was through the Research and Learning Center. But the Learning Center gives you a great, a great, you know, I guess, curriculum, if you will, for a variety of different topics. And to some folks, this might be overwhelming looking at all these topics, but we have a great search box up here in the top right-hand corner. So if I just type in the word international, for example, I, can see, I will get a list of all the different courses, maybe it's a video, maybe it's an archived webinar that we have done in the past, which will talk about international investing, how to use the tools, talk about some of the same concepts that we've talked about over the past hour. So that's under Research and Learning Center, and all I did was type in the word international in the search box, and it gives me just a number of different ways where I can take this information and take it the next step and learn more. So hopefully you found this helpful. Um, we have a lot of different ways that we can research international um, investments, if you will, not only from the big picture macroeconomic ideas, but also getting very specific. So, and I'll just offer this again. If, if this is something that interests you or you want to learn more how to use these tools and navigate through the website and put some of this to work, by all means, contact your financial consultant or call up your financial consultant and ask to speak with your, set up an appointment for your regional brokerage consultant, and we'd be more than happy to help you. So with that, I will turn it back over to Denise to see if there are any questions so far um, about the material today. Great. Thank you so much. Um, excellent presentation, everyone. Uh, starting with the highest voted question, What's the best split in a portfolio between developed and emerging market stocks? I think that would be a good question for you, Matt. Um, sure, good question. I think, um, you know, just a recap is what we discussed a little bit earlier with the, the view of the sample asset allocation models. We, you know, generally speaking, we think for most investors with the long-term sort of retirement-focused part of their portfolio, they should have roughly... 30% of their equity allocated to non-U.S. stocks. Now, within that, to your question, what is developed and emerging, you know, a simple way to kind of look at that is just to use the sort of market capitalization uh, mix of the international marketplace um, as your proxy. So 
Today, roughly, that breakdown is about 80% developed market exposure, so the, the Japan, the Canada, the Europe, and 20% emerging markets. So, again, I think forcing us to do a little math here, um, get your overall international mix correct, 30% 30, 30 of your stock exposure should be international, and then to your question, consider splitting up that international as something in the neighborhood of 80% developed, 20% uh, emerging markets. That would give you kind of the market cap weight, uh, which could be a good sp starting point. Again, uh, specific, uh, you know, al actual allocations can certainly flex up or down based on the customer's preferences or point of view in the market as well. Thank you. Uh, how much international equity should an average investor have? Yeah, so my comments earlier, I think, just, just touched on that, Denise. Um, go with that rule of thumb, 30-30-70 ratio, uh, international uh, to domestic. And again, um, that's a starting point, as I just mentioned. Your personal take on the market can inform that, your tolerance for risk. Jake, I know your organization has done a number of research on this, and, or, uh, you know, in practice, uh, you know, investors can achieve a lot of the diversification benefit with some tolerance level to that 30%. So you want to be closer to 30 than zero, um, but you don't feel like you have to go exactly to that number. Um, yeah, I mean, I think 30 is a great starting point. Uh, it may matter what your goal is for international. If your goal is diversification, 30 is a great point, maybe even more. Uh, if your goal is total growth, you may want to kind of think about, you've got a very long time horizon, you may want to kind of think about maybe going for those markets that provide more growth opportunities. But again, I kind of said before that uh, over a long term, we do think emerging markets are the markets that do provide that growth opportunities. So again, 30% is about right. There's no magic number out there, but uh, statistically, mathematically, that's basically what we've, we've come to, and, and it kind of makes sense for a U.S.-based investor. And remember, that's percent of equity. Yes. <clears throat> Thanks for those additional comments. Uh, what is Fidelity's outlook for China and emerging markets, both short-term and long-term? Uh, so I'll take that one. Uh, so the asset allocation research team, we have done a lot of work trying to figure out what's going on in China. Uh, the reason for that is because over the last several years, if you're basically able to get your China call right, you can get a, basically get a good idea of how the greater emerging market complex is going to perform, and also the fact that China is the second largest economy in the world right now uh, basically does have influence on uh, the U.S. So our outlook for China, and you kind of asked it in the right, in the right sense, is what's our view in the short term and the long term? Well, I'll start in the long term. Over the long term, China, believe it or not, actually does have more favorable demographic and productivity growth prospects. Our long-term 20-year view is that that economy will grow faster than the U.S. So that's a 20-year average, long time away, but basically we think that that will be kind of the general direction where they head. However, over the very short term, we've, if you look at our recent business cycle updates that I've alluded to before, we do have China in the middle of a growth recession. That basically means they're still growing positively, but their growth rates are significantly deviated from their trend rate of growth. And so that basically means is that when you have an economy to kind of in that prospect, that means that equity markets generally don't behave that well. However, the fact that we've been China has been in a growth recession for some time, uh, the whole global economy is kind of getting over this global trade recession that uh, we've kind of been following. That basically I think that's kind of ended at some point in, in the early to middle of 2015. The best time to kind of think about getting exposure to a market is when it's gotten beat up the most, when basically direction points have changed, when there's inflection points to kind of take advantage of. And basically, over the short term, we don't see any, any basically particular reason why there'd be any financial crisis in China, as policymakers are definitely focusing on keeping things in check there. And there could be, in addition to kind of long-term general trends potentially upward, there could be inflection trends over the short term as well. Uh, we don't expect basically any massive, huge early cycle, wonderful returns. Don't expect like double-digit, triple-digit gains over the next couple of years. But in general, we do think that uh, overall the emerging market complex will get a general boost from stabilization from the Chinese economy. 
Thank you. Um, a lot of people are asking, and it's been in the news about the eurozone, and wondering if, if investment in the eurozone is wise at this time, given the weakness of their economy and the ongoing strength of the dollar. And maybe just talk about um, the upcoming um, decision about leaving the European Union. Yeah, about Britain, Britain leaving the European Union, also known as, as uh, Brexit. Uh, yeah, the euro. It's, it's a funny one. The euro. Uh, it is there. Another kind of myth or misconception is that Europe will just has always been kind of weak, always been slow. Uh, our view, in fact, and I kind of think I just alluded to this, is that their economy in general, Germany in particular, or even in some of the periphery, uh, in, in, in Spain and Italy, their economies are actually in a better cyclical place than the U.S. right now. Look at first quarter GDP. I think in the eurozone it was about two, two point two percent on an annualized basis, whereas in the U.S. it was about half of that, or even less than half of that. So there was better growth in the eurozone over the first, over the last couple quarters. Uh, so um, again, kind of thinking about things from a cyclical perspective, uh, that could be potential opportunities there. And again, I also mentioned the dollar. I think we're probably at the end of this multi-year rally in the dollar. Which way the dollar is going to go from here, who knows? That should not be a major deterrent or reason that you should probably think about investing uh, within the Eurozone inter or internationally. And then Brexit. Now, this is one where it's in the news all the time. The vote, the referendum is going to be June 23rd. Everyone's focused on it. I think if you turn on CNBC, they're probably talking about it right now. Uh, but basically the point here is that should you deviate from a long-term sound, well-thought-out investment strategy just because of a vote, which you don't know what's going to happen, and then also the results also potentially have taken years to have impacts on the overall real economy. Will there be volatility in currency markets? Will there be volatility in equity markets coming up to the vote? Yes. Most likely, in terms of what the kind of the, the proxy or general thought is, Great Britain will stay in the Eurozone. Uh, but if they leave, it doesn't necessarily mean anything is immediately over and detrimental to the overall economies. Will it kill their cycles? We don't think so. And so I guess you could think is it may accelerate this kind of populist type of view or kind of political kind of trend we've been seeing both in Europe, the U.S., and kind of in the overall globe. But does that mean anything to stock markets over the near term or the intermediate term? We don't think so. So therefore, it's kind of more of a long-term type of impact and could kind of uh, make you kind of think about your overall allocation over the very long term. But it does not mean you should trade ahead uh, of or after whatever the vote, no matter which way it comes out. Thanks. Um, before I, I have two questions for Greg, but before I move on to that, what percentage of the global equity market is U.S. versus non-U.S.? Uh, the global equity market is about 50-50, so 50% uh, U.S., 50% uh, international. Uh, looking at it from kind of a GDP perspective, overall gross domestic product, uh, about 75% of the world uh, world's uh, GDP is located outside of the U.S. So kind of when we're thinking about, you know, this again, the 70 U.S., 30% international exposure, there is some U.S. home bias there, uh, but a lot of the reason is because we think that as, inter as kind of U.S.-based investors, it does make sense to have kind of a, a greater percentage of your, of, your, um, of your equities to your home country, uh, and that, um, but, but overall, there's probably uh, even more opportunities out there, uh, but we're kind of keeping it safe here at 70-30 rather than just basically saying go 50-50, because that's really the breakdown with, of what uh, the overall stock market, market cap is. Thank you. Well, I think, um, Greg, it's a couple of questions for you uh, until we run out of time here. We've got a couple minutes to go. Uh, two questions. What is the easiest way to find someone's asset allocation to international? And then talk about can someone invest in international individual stocks? Sure. Thanks, Denise, and, and good questions. And, um, you know, one of the way, the way, the easiest way we can find out what our current portfolio looks like from a domestic versus international perspective is by using the analysis tab on fidelity.com. Um, and so the guided portfolio summary, which is included in the analysis tab, will break down the equity portion of your portfolio and tell you what you have domestic versus equity. And one thing I did not mention when I was covering this earlier was that even if you have outside accounts, maybe outside of Fidelity, and you'd like to take a look at the entire picture, not only what you have here at Fidelity, but what you have maybe outside, 
you can always add those outside accounts in in order to get a full and complete analysis. So to wrap up, um, that's under Portfolio Summary in the Analysis tab. And I think the second question was um, in terms of individual stock research. Um, I recommend that everyone that's interested in maybe individual stocks um, go to fidelity.com slash international trading. This will allow you to sign up for our international trading offering, which allows you to directly invest in 25 different countries and hold up to 16 different currencies in your existing brokerage account. And there is a sign-up procedure. And this allows you to open up the research capabilities for individual stocks as well. So again, fidelity.com slash international trading. And again, our international trading offering is very competitive. It allows you to invest in companies um, that trade directly on foreign exchanges for a very reasonable fee. Um, and it, again, it's 25 different countries, and you can hold up to 16 different currencies in the account. Yeah. Thank and, you very much. Janine, I might, to, I'm, Denise, I might yeah, just add on to that in the spirit of, you know, certainly welcome customers and encourage them to invest how they choose, but just in the spirit of incentivizing good behavior, for the most part, most investors can really achieve the benefits of international investing in terms of diversification with a broadly diversified fund or ETF. And, you know, when Greg earlier went through that demo looking at the ETF evaluator and the mutual fund evaluator, where you want to be looking there is primarily in um, uh, the categories foreign large growth and foreign large blend. And those will be the diversified products that will get you broadly invested across the non-U.S. opportunity developed markets, emerging markets. And, and from there, you'll have your baseline allocation. I, I just want to make that point because, you know, we are an open architecture platform. We offer over 500 funds and hundreds of ETFs, many of those products I would consider the spice in your portfolio versus um, the real uh, entree, so to speak. And so just remember, get your diversified exposure nailed down first um, before you start to look at less diversified approaches like ETFs that are more narrow or even individual stocks. 